All right, terrific. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Joan Woodward, and I'm honored to lead the Travelers Institute, which is the public policy division and educational arm of Travelers Insurance. It's great to be back with you this year as we continue our Wednesday with Woodward series uh, with a fantastic lineup of speakers, especially today, to explore issues impacting our personal and professional lives uh, live and living through these very difficult and uncertain times. So today we're thrilled to be joined by the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy, the Partnership for New York City and Kathy Wild, and our Small Business and Entrepreneurship Council for partnership in this program. Uh, we're really pleased that you're here today with us and hope you'll stay engaged with us throughout the year. Uh, you can join our mailing list by emailing institute at travelers.com to be added to the email list to get our invitations. You can also connect with me on LinkedIn or watch replays of past webinars on travelersinstitute.org. So before we get started, I'd like to share a disclaimer about today's program. Today's topic is a very timely one, the race to distribute a COVID-19 vaccine. To date, two vaccines have received emergency use authorization from the US FDA, one from Pfizer and one from Moderna. Distribution of these vaccines has started, beginning with healthcare workers, the elderly, although this week additional groups may be added as well. It's certainly a milestone in the world's fight against the coronavirus and one that many of us have been really eagerly anticipating. But now that we have the vaccine, we face the challenge of distribution. And distribution, as you know, whether it's insurance distribution of products, it's really critical in understanding how to manage the supply chain. How do we get from here to inoculate the vast population in the United States and in fact the world? Here to help us today to understand what this might look like is Dr. Mark McClellan. Dr. McClellan is former FDA commissioner under President George Bush. So Mark, welcome, and we're so thrilled to have you here. Uh, Dr. McClellan is currently the Robert J. Margolis Professor of Business, Medicine and Policy, and the founding director of the Duke Margolis Center for Health Policy at Duke University. The center draws on Duke's research, education, and engagement capabilities to help inform policymakers and create a better healthcare system. Most notably, the center is addressing the COVID-19 pandemic as a member of the COVID Collaboration. Now, this is a group of the nation's leading public health, education, and economic experts who are working with state and local leaders to help stop the spread of coronavirus and safely and sustainably reopen our businesses, our schools, and our communities. Prior to joining uh, the center, Dr. McClellan, as I said, served as the head of the FDA under Bush, and thus has really intimate knowledge of what it takes to develop, approve, and distribute a new vaccine in the US. In addition, Dr. McClellan is a former administrator of the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services. And if you don't know what that is, it's under the Department of HHS, and it is all of Medicare and all of Medicaid. So in these roles, he implemented major reforms in health policy, including adding a prescription drug benefit in the Medicare program, Medicare and Medicaid payment reforms, the FDA's critical path initiative, and the public-private initiatives to develop better information uh, on the quality of cost and care. He also serves as a member of the President's Council. He also served as a member of the President's Council of Economic Advisors, Senior Director for Healthcare Policy at the White House, and Deputy Assistant Secretary for Economic Policy at the Department of Treasury. He holds a PhD from MIT, as well as an MD and an MPA from Harvard. Dr. McClellan also currently serves on the board of Johnson & Johnson and of Cigna, as well as a few other private companies. Before I hand it over to Dr. McClellan for a quick note, uh, we're gonna have time at the end of this program for your audience questions, but please don't hesitate and wait to submit your questions. Please do it uh, as we're speaking. You can do that by uh, uh, the Q&A function at the bottom middle of your screen. And if you don't want me to read your name, you can send it anonymously. So we're truly honored to have you with us, Dr. McClellan, today, and we really appreciate your time. Hey, Joan, great to be with you and your colleagues on, I guess, the special Thursday edition of uh, Wednesdays with Woodward, but a lot of these days kind of look the same uh, anyway, I guess. <laughs> They're all running together. Yeah, we threw a little curveball to start the year. <laughs> so you know what, let's just kick off right away with a procurement of vaccine doses. And uh, we have a slide here to, for you to kind of mm -hmm. talk to 
So early on, the federal government pre-purchased these vaccine candidates uh, before they were even approved, right? Including right. 100 million from Moderna, 100 million from Pfizer, and companies move forward with manufacturing these. Um, was that unprecedented? Had, had companies ever moved forward with manufacturing hundreds of millions of doses um, even before the FDA approved, or is this a, a first time thing? Joanne, this is uh, unprecedented in many respects. Uh, prior to this pandemic, we did have national stockpiles for some emergency response activities, but never anything at this scale. This uh, level of commitment to manufacturing, um, even before we knew whether the vaccines would work or not, enabled us to go from what has been a very linear and uh, uncertain process for vaccine development where you do preclinical testing and then small clinical studies and large ones then only after you figure out if things really work you do this kind of large-scale manufacturing to a really hyper parallel process so a lot of things could happen at once you know a concerted effort to do large-scale clinical trials even as large-scale manufacturing was underway so we've never seen a pace of vaccine development like we've seen in this pandemic less than a year from when the virus first uh, started spreading to having millions of shots in arms uh, it's it's uh, really an unprecedented achievement so, so how does this all work? Give us the background of how these purchasing options and kind of deals are reached. I mean, how do the companies themselves decide, well, I'll cut a deal with the U.S. government for 200 million doses. You know, what about China, the U.K.? I'm sure countries have just lined up all over the world demanding these doses. And how, how do the companies kind of think about allocation? Well, this because of the scope of the pandemic, I think you saw the companies all coming forward, um, not just because they saw uh, a business opportunity here in terms of manufacturing effective vaccines, but uh, this is an unprecedented public health emergency. And we've seen as a result, uh, a lot of collaboration between companies, including all the ones you have listed here, the US government and governments around the world to respond. Uh, what most of these agreements involve is the company going at risk to some extent, uh, spending a significant amount of their capital and in investing in additional manufacturing capacity and um, uh, the purchasing. There are a whole lot of advanced purchase contracts that go along with the vaccine. You got to have like glass vials to put it in and, and uh, gotta have confidence that you're going to have the complementary supplies when you need them, like uh, needles, uh, syringes, uh, et cetera. Um, so that only is possible really with a significant level of government involvement, uh, not only sharing some of the financial risk with the companies by giving them contracts where they get paid some uh, for the manufacturing, even if the vaccine doesn't work out, not all, so it's joint risk, uh, but also the uh, governments uh, making contracts for everything you need to go along with vaccination at this scale, uh, the, the protective equipment, the needles, um, the syringes, the glass vials, et cetera. Um, that's happened in the US. It's happened in other developed countries in the EU, Britain, uh, Australia, Japan, et cetera. And it's also happened in other parts of the world with other manufacturers besides the ones that the US government is working with so closely. So there are several Chinese uh, vaccinations in uh, uh, emergency use in some parts of the world now that went through kind of a similar process, Chinese government investing in some cases working with other countries to uh, make uh, supplies available. Um, some uh, uh, vaccine, Russia's developed a vaccine. I, I'm not as convinced by it. its uh, supporting evidence, um, but collectively that means there are going to be hundreds of millions of doses of vaccines with pretty good evidence behind them uh, that uh, will be available this year. So those numbers of doses, um, you know, again, uh, 200 million from Pfizer and 200 million from Moderna, and we'll talk about some of the other companies under development, but uh, those, so those are 400 million doses. Where is yeah. that compared to where we need to be to, uh, you know, vaccinate our whole population? Well, I mean, it, it, it partly it depends, right, on whether the additional vaccines that haven't yet quite completed their clinical development turn out to work as well as these first two, the uh, Moderna and the Pfizer-BioNTech uh, vaccines. As you've got on the chart, that's 400 million doses expected by the end of the second 
quarter. Um, so that's enough for potentially 200 million people uh, by, actually that's by later this year. So potentially 200 million people um, by later this year, since it's two, um, two doses uh, uh, for each person. Um, the J&J vaccine is on track and no, you know, I'm on the board, but no, uh, uh, no private knowledge here. Uh, the way these clinical trials work is there's an independent group of uh, clinical experts that oversee the trial. When they see enough events of related to COVID happening in the trial, uh, they get to take a look at, at how many of those events happen in the group that got the vaccine versus the group that was randomized to placebo. And then they determine, well, does it look like there's a strong enough effect that we can end the trial now? That first look for the J&J vaccine is on track for happening maybe in the next week or so, uh, these clinical trials have gone pretty fast in part because there are just so many uh, COVID cases out there around the United States and other parts of the world where the trials are taking place. Uh, J and J, uh, there's some news on this this week. Maybe is running a little bit slower than uh, had hoped for the February doses, but should have close to 50 million doses available by the end of the first quarter. 100 million, as you put up here, by the end of the second quarter. That would get us a long way to having enough doses for the U.S. population. Uh, Novavax, also on your chart, has these advanced so-called phase three trials underway now. They're a little bit further behind, probably March or so before those trials are, are completed. But Novavax could also be in the U.S. market at significant scale in the second quarter. So that's uh, collectively, that, that's enough to vaccinate the U.S. population by later in the second quarter this year, at least everybody who wants it. As you can see, uh, there's potentially even more doses on this list, and that's because uh, the government working with the companies wanted to have some insurance policies, you know, not put all their uh, bets on one vaccine when we didn't know which one, if any, were going to work. So uh, if there are additional doses available, that can potentially be kept uh, to some extent in a reserve if needed, but also could be used to expand access in the rest of the world. And other countries that have enough money to do it, basically, are taking a similar strategy. They invested in several vaccines typically. Uh, they're aiming to get enough for their populations as soon as possible in 2021. But if all of those global vaccination contracts with high-income countries do in fact come through, if all of these vaccines end up working, uh, that'll make a, a lot of additional doses available for the rest of the world. Finally, there's an effort underway in low and middle income countries supported by an international effort called COVAX uh, that some countries, not the US, has contributed to um, that is on track for maybe a couple of hundred million doses this year, which is not nearly enough for the you know, remaining uh, uh, four to five billion people in the rest of the world. Um, so there's additional ramp up of supply expected. For example, j and is expecting to produce uh, a billion plus doses this year, Pfizer is increasing their capacity to get to the billion dose level. Uh, and if those that if these vaccines all work, we could also have significant vaccine availability in low and middle income countries uh, by the second half of 2021, but probably extending well into 2022 before there's very uh, broad availability of vaccinations globally. Great. Thank you so much for that overview. We're very hopeful that all the other companies are as successful as the first, first couple here. Yeah. So, so on Tuesday, the Department of Health and Human Services really did change course, right? Announcing these yeah. two major changes in distribution. First, they recommend that states open up the vaccine to everyone over 65 and young people with certain health conditions. Second, it says the government no longer hold back the second dose and, and uh, vaccinate just everyone. So, so talk to us. And I know Joe Biden tonight, uh, President-elect, is going to uh, roll out his plan for uh, vaccination. So talk to us about the distribution process and challenges we've seen to date and how this impacted you know, the decision to speed these things up in the Trump administration. And you know, do you think this is going to work, this new strategy? Yeah, this is a, a really challenging um, implementation program that U.S. has never before. Some of you um, may remember polio vaccination in the 1950s. The U.S. really has never before had a public health um, implementation program at this scale. Whole population, multiple vaccines, multiple doses. Uh, in the midst of a, of, of a raging um, public health emergency pandemic. 
that's challenging. Um, and we've talked about, uh, Joan, all of these remarkable steps in terms of doing the clinical trials quickly without cutting corners, doing the large scale manufacturing. The federal government backed by the US military has set up a distribution system for these early vaccines while they're in limited supply where basically the states can connect to the federal government which monitors on an ongoing basis the vaccine inventory and then distributes it out to where the states wanted to go according to these priorities. And we did, uh, there was a pretty extensive effort um, led by the Centers for Disease Control and their independent expert group, their advisory committee on immunization practices to lay out who should get vaccinated first. They came up with a whole priority list. I, I'm sure many of you have heard of, starting with uh, uh, the so-called uh, uh, group 1A uh, of um, uh, frontline healthcare workers and people in nursing homes. You know, nursing homes having been so hard hit uh, in the in the pandemic. And then Group 1B was going to include um, uh, other very high risk groups, elderly people over 75, some frontline workers like um, uh, grocery store workers uh, who have also had high rates of COVID, also other essential workers like teachers, since we really need to get um, uh, kids back in schools. And there was going to be a group 1C that included other people at high risk, um, uh, people over 65, uh, uh, um, people with um, other serious uh, chronic conditions that put them at elevated risk. <laughs> what we've seen happen is the initial distribution led to some gaps, uh, not, not the distribution out to the, to the states and, and where the governor said they wanted the vaccine to go, but that last mile from the hospitals or uh, the public health agencies that were gonna administer the vaccines, uh, or that last inch maybe into people's actual arms, uh, that's where it's been challenging. Uh, the hospitals right now that are trying to vaccinate their frontline workers are also facing absolute peak levels of highest levels we've seen uh, of uh, COVID cases, hospitalizations, deaths. So they're really stretched. Um, the nursing homes, uh, it takes some effort. To, these are typically not huge institutions. So, you know, doing 80 or 90 um, nursing home residents and, and workers in a day uh, would be quite an achievement. So, so that's ended up taking some time. And in addition, uh, public health uh, workforces have been really stretched too. There's some public health local agencies, you know, you've seen them on the news. They've uh, tried to open up vaccination uh, clinics, um, but they get so much more demand that they can't meet it all and, and they have a limited amount of staffing, uh, can't answer all the phones and so forth. So we've had these gaps emerge. Uh, right now, um, probably about 40 million doses are totally available, have been manufactured. More than 20 million of those have been uh, distributed to states, probably on the order of 22 or so million today, probably about 10 million or so actual vaccinations. And the vast majority of those are the round one vaccinations just starting to get to, uh, to, to round two now. And that's led to a lot of pressure to open it up um, availability of vaccines more widely. And Joan, that's what led to the announcement uh, on Tuesday by HHS, which said, you know, sort of like, um, you know, the. Uh, strategic advice from uh, Mike Tyson, you know, everybody's got a strategy until they get hit, <laughs> that uh, you, you have to, uh, there, there is so much pressure from, in all seriousness, from the high level of cases and spread and new variants, uh, that it really adds to the pressure to just get as many shots in arms of as many people at elevated risk as quickly as possible without so much of a careful, you know, mechanical distinction of all of these levels. So HHS basically said, if you're over 65, or if you have a chronic condition, or if you're an essential worker, you should be able to get access to a vaccine and, and states get those shots in arms as quickly as possible. Uh, so what that's done is opened up some more avenues for distributing vaccines and kind of simplified the process for determining if you're eligible. So if there's some proof that you're a, a teacher or an essential worker, that you're over 65, uh, you can get a vaccine. And uh, Joan, as you might guess, there probably are, uh, well, there definitely are tens of millions of Americans in those categories that really want uh, a vaccine. And I think for the coming weeks, we're going to be working through that whole set of people who, you know, 
we've ta- heard a lot about vaccine hesitancy and it's a re- real issue, but for those tens of millions of Americans and high-risk groups who want the vaccines now, uh, they're gonna try to get it as quickly as possible. And that's why you're seeing uh, more steps opening up access um, events at Disneyland, uh, football stadiums, um, uh, more uh, vaccines being distributed to pharmacies that can uh, give out uh, shots in, in communities uh, all over the country. Uh, we started out maybe doing 100, couple of 100,000 immunizations per day. Uh, by today, we're probably up to 700,000, 800,000 range. Uh, the Biden administration said they had a goal of a million doses, a million vaccinations per day for each of the first 100 days. Uh, we may be at that number before next Thursday with this kind of opening up of, uh, uh, of capacity. Uh, and that's a, a good thing from a public health standpoint when you're in the midst of a pandemic. The more people uh, who are immunized, the fewer hospitalizations you're going to get, the less stress on the healthcare system. Uh, that's really important. The, the challenge here, the downside, Joan, is that um, those, those more uh, nuanced groups really tried to get the vaccines first to not only the people who wanted it the most, but the people where there was for impact on the economy reasons or health reasons, you know, the, the, the very um, biggest uh, um, value for the vaccines, or at least their judgment about the biggest value. And what we're probably going to see is for the next couple of months, uh, lots and lots of people getting vaccines, opening up of, uh, of new capabilities for uh, delivering those vaccines, trying to meet that demand. So, you know, I'd be surprised if we don't get closer to, you know, maybe 2 million doses a day at, at some point uh, in, uh, uh, in February and in, into March. Uh, but there's still a lot of Americans who are more hesitant. Um, Um, And they're disproportionately represented among rural populations, among low income populations, among minority populations for a whole host of reasons. Uh, Those are some of the populations that have actually been hardest hit uh, by the pandemic. And so what we'll probably see is some disparities emerging with uh, high rates of use in some uh, population groups in some areas and bigger gaps in others. And we're not really going to have this pandemic under control until we get to high levels of immunity in every group in our population, particularly, you know, workers and and, and others in neighborhoods where there have been uh, uh, a lot of outbreaks. So this is some hard work ahead. Um, You mentioned the the Biden administration. They're going to announce sort of the outlines of the uh, of the main uh, uh, Biden uh, COVID response plan later today. Uh, it's going to include a lot of economic elements, uh, additional help for people um, with uh, income, additional checks, um, additional uh, unemployment insurance, additional help for businesses that have been hard hit and continue to be hard hit, but also some further steps on vaccinations and other policies. The other policies include uh, a lot more support for testing, including testing in schools and some of these high-risk workplaces uh, over the next few months before we get to broader immunity, Um, uh, a public health core, uh, many more public health workers to help uh, with these activities, Uh, more spending to increase the effective uh, vaccine supply so that you can more confidently, you know, not hold back and reserve uh, uh, all the vaccines you need for the second dose. You think of it as just-in-time manufacturing and distribution. Uh, so that uh, you can can ramp up the supply further. Um, that I think the estimated cost for that is going to be 160 billion dollars just for these vaccination testing and other direct COVID response components, and a lot more for steps like uh, reopening schools, including a goal of getting K through eight uh, reopened nationwide by March, uh, and testing and other steps to support that, and then all of those economic steps. Um, that program is probably going to build on what we've already seen. You know, being flexible about who who can get the vaccine, at least within these broad risk groups. Uh, if some additional people, you know, use some of the extra shots, well, you know, we'd like to prioritize it, but the main goal is just getting lots of shots in arms fast. Uh, so I think you're going to see an even more doubling down on this approach uh, as the new administration comes in. Okay. Okay. Well, that, that was a lot there. That was re- <laughs> just really terrific. I, you know, I know you're in on the inside baseball of all of this, so it's just so great to hear your perspectives. But I have a question, you know, coming up from a medical perspective. So what sort of drop-off are you going to expect to see from the first to the second dose for this shot? And is there any, you know, what are the protections afforded to you by, if you just get one dose? I mean, I know the shingles dose, there's a couple other vaccinations out there that you have to get the yeah. second dose for it to be, you know, highly effective. And, and then, you know, when you speak about the rural population, 
do you think there'll be some sort of you know public awareness campaign to get the Hollywood stars involved to get yeah. to get to get some a level of really just awareness about how critical it is for people to get these vaccines to to create this herd immunity that we'd like to see in the population and, and what's your view of herd immunity is it 60 percent 70 percent of the population being vaccinated so, so there are a few things unpacked there but just first with the 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 two doses I, I do think we're going to do pretty well, at least for this initial phase of vaccination and getting people back for the second dose. That's what some other countries like Israel are experiencing so far. And part of the reason for that is the people who are getting vaccinated now are the ones who really want it. They've had it with COVID. They trust the vaccine. They want to move beyond this. Uh, and so that is a strong motivator to, to get back and get the second dose. Um, you mentioned like the shingles vaccine, some others that involve uh, boosters a couple of months apart. These are even tighter together. So as long as we don't, you know, flub it up, as long as there is plenty of supply for people to go back to, to, to get it, I think at least initially we should do pretty well on the uh, uh, adherence to that to that two dose strategy. You know, and and you know, people are going to get help with this. You know, healthcare organizations or will administer it to their own workers. They've got a strong interest in making sure their workforce isn't going to be compromised going forward, given how much uh, uh, burden they're facing right now. Nursing homes, same thing. Uh, and then a lot of these um, very motivated individuals who who want to make sure they get uh, get get the immunity. Where I worry more about that, Joan, is as we get you know, as I was saying earlier, as we get beyond the people who really, really want the shot to the ones who are unsure right now. And if they do it, you know, you um, probably need to make it easier for them. You know, there are a lot of people who can't easily drive to uh, go to a drive through They may not have a car or may not, uh, um, you know, easily be able to make an online appointment or, or, or something like that. Um, and as we get to that stage, that's where things are going to get more uh, complex uh, for, for getting the second dose. You know, some of the highest uh, rates of outbreaks uh, have been in uh, homeless shelters or in jails. And if people are there temporarily, not there the next month, um, we don't have any great mechanisms for, uh, for following them. So probably you'll see more of these challenges around second doses uh, uh, emerging, um, uh, emerging uh, a little bit later on. And then in terms of this question about um, uh, herd immunity, um, yeah, it does look like the vaccines are, are, are really effective. Um, as, as you know, if we can get immunity that not only protects us from getting symptoms, uh, but also protects us from getting infected uh, and then transmitting that infection along, uh, that's really critical for, for herd immunity. And the one thing, one, one important thing that we weren't able to determine that you normally determine um, if we weren't in a public health emergency as a vaccine became available is just how protective are these vaccines in terms of, you know, they're clearly very protective in keeping you from getting even minor symptoms, let alone hospitalized or worse. Um, what we don't know yet, because it just takes time, is whether they also prevent you from even uh, getting um, uh, COVID asymptomatically at all and being able to transmit it to other people. The way that we're going to answer that question is by tracking lots and lots of people who have been fully vaccinated. You know, they've been they're weeks beyond their second shot. And comparing them, uh, we're going to have to screen them using the, the, the usual COVID tests, uh, since they're probably not going to have any symptoms at all, screen them and compare them to another to a matched population that hasn't been vaccinated um, uh, for uh, whether or not they are more likely or, or hopefully significantly less likely to pick up the virus and then uh, uh, be able to transmit it. Uh, um, so we'll know the answer to that, hopefully within a couple of months. In the meantime, and, and I'm fairly optimistic that, I mean, the vaccines yeah. look so effective uh, that they could should give you a good deal of what's called a mucosal immunity. The, the virus can't even take up shop, let alone cause serious symptoms. So I'm, I'm fairly optimistic, but we don't know. And in the meantime, it's really important to, even if you've been vaccinated, uh, to, you know, it's good that you are reassured that you're not gonna be likely, at all likely to get sick, um, but very important to keep up the distancing, keep up the mass uh, in the workplaces, same thing, distancing, mass, washing hands, all the things that we know are, are really critical. And then and hope that we get a good answer to that question um, with experience with the vaccines over the next couple of months. Okay, terrific. Um, let's talk about these newest strains of the vaccine. So if a virus is constantly mutating, um, yeah. you know, coming from different countries, now I understand there's a new US version of, of uh, the mutation. 
well, these existing vaccines, people are saying they're going to offer the same protection, but are you worried about that in terms of the strains? Yeah, I am concerned about it, Joan, not so much for the vaccines that we have available now, unless we see a, a good deal more rapid mutation than has been the case so far. Uh, but over time, you know, viruses, uh, they, they do mutate. Uh, everybody knows that they have to get a flu shot every year because uh, the, the influenza virus is just very different uh, from year to year. So your, your immunity to last year's um, yeah. uh, flu is still there. It's just not relevant anymore because the virus has changed so much. Is and what we're starting to see- yeah. Is it still, is it too late to get a, va a flu vaccine? And are you recommending no, highly that people get it? It's getting to be too or? late, but, but, but not too late uh, right now. I would encourage if you haven't gotten one, uh, this is a good year to, uh, to get one and avoid having you know, any symptoms that, that, that look like COVID and, and putting any more strain on our, our healthcare system. Uh, but, but should do that right away. Um, for the, the COVID vaccines though, um, what the vaccines have created is, is a reaction against a number of different parts of the virus. Now, some of those parts of the COVID, uh, the, the so-called SARS-CoV-2 virus do change pretty rapidly, but some of them don't. Uh, and the vaccines have been developed were deliberately designed to go against multiple sites on the, uh, on the virus. Uh, so hopefully, what we've seen so far is that these individual virus mutations, which are real and are causing more rapid spread in lots of parts of the world. Uh, England is on lockdown uh, in, in significant part because of a more transmissible version there. South Africa is having a raging um, out, uh, outbreaks uh, in that country, even in the middle of winter, I'm sorry, in the middle of summer, it's middle of summer there when you, you know, people should be out and apart and so forth, should be less transmission uh, because they've got a really tough um, uh, variant and they're starting to spread in the US that's partly what led to the revision in these vaccination okay. strategies is we are running uh, uh, a, a very uh, fast race in time against the spread of these more uh, contagious versions. So we need to get as many people vaccinated as quickly as possible. Um, but those individual changes are probably not going to render the, the vaccines ineffective. On the other hand, over time, as these add up and you know, now the virus has been pretty much spreading unchecked, uh, for the past year, now we're starting to fight back. And because these mutations do come along, because the virus is, is so widespread all over the world, uh, we're going to be selecting more, as more people get vaccinated, the, the strains that keep, uh, that stay around are the ones that get around that. So we're going to see more of these probably emerge in the months ahead. So really important will be to keep an eye on those, keep checking to make sure the vaccines we have now uh, are uh, protective against the variants uh, over time, hopefully not rapid time, but over time, the vaccines that we take are likely to become less effective against the form of um, uh, COVID that's out there. You know, uh, the common cold virus is another coronavirus. Uh, so, you know, we know that these viruses can change in ways that you know, kind of keep them coming back. So uh, to prevent that, um, Scott Gottlieb and I wrote an op-ed in the Wall Street Journal this week about how important it is to have a national, really a global surveillance system where we're not only checking to see if there are outbreaks of COVID, but doing the so-called gene sequencing of each of the, uh, of a sample of the viruses that are turning up in all parts of the country to see if there are these variants emerging and to test those against the vaccines that we have and also the treatments like the monoclonal antibodies uh, because they will uh, get less effective over time because the viruses do mutate. What we don't know yet is um, how rapidly that's gonna happen. Um, and, but we need to get prepared now for, just like we do with the flu, uh, having sort of a base vaccine platform, uh, but one that we can modify pretty quickly uh, to uh, keep up with the, the changes in the virus. So, so, you know, talking about changes of the virus, um, both of the Pfizer and Moderna are only approved for adults. I think Pfizer is over 16 years old and Moderna is over 18 years old. Yeah. So, so what do we think about our children and how is this going to impact, you know, the schools in, in, in next fall? Are the, are the companies doing 
you know, trials, clinical trials on children these days, or when are we going to expect our children to be vaccinated? They are. And I think, um, Joan, doing it in mind with um, fall going back to, to school time frame. So, um, you know, fortunately, um, kids are much less likely to have serious consequences from COVID. That's why all these early first vaccine studies were not on kids. You know, we want to get a good idea about the effectiveness of the vaccine and the safety of the vaccine in populations that really were facing more risk and would benefit more personally from, uh, uh, from taking the vaccine. Uh, now that we know that we have vaccines that look very effective and uh, also quite safe, uh, there are studies getting underway in uh, children under 16. Uh, they're going to probably include some modifications in the vaccine to be more suited to, um, you know, to younger uh, bodies. And they're probably not going to be as, as large as the trials that we have already. They'll probably focus on things like, uh, are there any safety issues, any serious side effects in kids that we didn't see in adults? There's no reason to expect any, but you know, you'd like to be sure. And do kids out as strong of an immune response to the virus as the adults did? Uh, if the answer to those is yes, they appear just about as safe in kids, and yes, uh, the vaccines uh, can be formulated in a way that gives kids a, a strong immune response, I would expect to see an, an authorization for vaccine for these, you know, potentially reformulated vaccines in children, um, probably, you know, sometime first half of this year, not, not, not right away, but but, you know, by uh, uh, late spring, summer, uh, with an eye towards having much more vaccination available in children by the time they go back to school in the fall. School reopening this year, um, look at the, the uh, Biden announcements coming out uh, today. This is a super high priority for him, uh, not just because it's so important for uh, kids' education, but so important for the, the, the workforce, especially women, to, uh, to be able to, to get back to, to work and, and to get us back towards normalcy. Um, um, so uh, we're not going to count on kids being vaccinated then. Can, kids do transmit the virus. There's some evidence that younger children are less likely to transmit than older children, although some of the new variants seem, you know, they don't make people sicker. Um, so they don't you know, make it more likely that kids will have serious consequences, but, but they do seem to transmit more in children. Um, so school reopening this year is going to have to happen with some special measures in place like masks and the like, uh, both to prevent spread among children and from children to adults or from children back to people at home. Um, so masking, uh, more testing, steps like that to, to give some confidence about uh, schools uh, reopening for part of this spring and, and maybe in the summer. There's some calls for uh, maybe uh, continuing school on into the summer since there's been so much, you know, there's so much evidence of so many kids falling behind um, this academic year. Um, but then hopefully uh, the vaccinations will work out and be a more more important part of uh, containment in kids and schools by the fall. Okay. I have two quick questions for you, and then we're going to open it up to audience. We have a ton of questions coming in from the audience here. Um, but we want to get your perspective on, on something that's really important for the business community. And I know every single company is kind of grappling with this. So how likely or important do you think it's going to be that employers will require COVID vaccines for, prior to their workforce kind of coming back into the office. I mean, we require kids to get vaccinated um, already yeah. to come to school uh, in most of the country and most of the school districts require a certain level of vaccination. Yeah. But now with this COVID, uh, a lot of employers are very worried and we see it in our, in our business of you know, selling insurance to different businesses. But what are your thoughts on mandating uh, that employees get that get it, and except for certain people who have health conditions, mm -hmm. um, and you know, are we really going to be able to reopen the whole, whole economy uh, without kind of this herd immunity of people? being vaccinated up to 80% of the population, for example. Yeah, I think we can get to uh, herd immunity without mandating vaccines in the short term. Um, just just to, to do the math for, for what it's going to take, we've got probably, you know, um, 10 million Americans are pretty close to it uh, um, infected uh, uh, so far. Um, uh, sorry, uh, 30, close to 20, 30 million Americans <laughs> infected uh, so far, 27, 20, you know, 25, 27, something like that. Um, and really probably more, many more than that, uh, that, that haven't had an official detection of their uh, infection. I think most of the epidemiologic estimates now, or maybe we're at, you know, 
18, 20% of the population that's actually been exposed. Given this really horrible surge we're in the midst of now, that's probably going to be 25% or more uh, by the end of January. So if we can get another you know, 40, 50% of people to, to take the vaccine uh, throughout our country, so not just in certain areas, but, but, but broadly, um, that's a pathway to something like uh, herd immunity, or certainly at least um, healthcare systems, you know, not being overburdened and so forth, even if we don't get that mucosal immunity, like I was talking about earlier, if, even if that's not full, um, you can see that happening before summer, you know, by the end of the second quarter, um, if, if things keep on track, as we've been talking about. Um, so, uh, uh, so we can get to a, a, a level of herd immunity uh, uh, if we do things right from here. Um, but uh, in terms of mandatory vaccinations, I, I absolutely expect that to happen, at least in high risk workplaces uh, over the coming months. Um, so right now there are very few places that do it at Duke University, you know, we've made it available to all of our frontline health workers and some have said no and, and you know, that's okay for now we're leaving, you know, we've got sort of full precautions in place anyway, PPE, distancing, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we have you know, very good confidence in our workplaces that we're not seeing any, yeah, people are showing up with COVID because we've got COVID all over the place, but we have very good confidence that we're containing spread within the workplace under these very modified conditions. If you wanna go to back to a workplace that is less modified, you need to be very confident uh, that you've got high, high levels of, uh, of immunity in your work uh, worker population uh, to relax some of those measures. And that's probably not going to happen in the next few months because you know we need to keep these measures in place anyway for all the reasons that I said and because we're still early on with the vaccines. But both Pfizer and Moderna are very much on track to complete their longer term clinical studies and do all the manufacturing stability, all the dotting the I's and crossing the T's that's necessary for a full approval, not just an emergency approval uh, by sometime this spring. And J&J &J will be aiming for that as well, assuming you know its studies go well from here. So by the second half of this year, uh, there should be several vaccines that are not just emergency approved, but fully approved with very good safety track records, regulatory data, and so forth. And I think after that point is when you'll start seeing uh, more requirements for getting vaccinations when people you know, really want to move forward with um, reducing some of the distancing measures and you know, getting more groups back together and, and, and things like that. So, uh, um, but I think it's much easier when you're not dealing with, you know, sort emergency use, but you're dealing with kind of normal, you know, FDA approved uh, vaccines. Okay. And my last question is actually one we got from the audience. So I'm going to read from Susan uh, McGurl at Hub International. So what is your advice, Mark, for those who are skeptical about receiving the vaccine? And again, is there going to be this public awareness campaign about the, you know, the, the, the value of getting the vaccine coming from the Biden administration? Yeah, there are a lot of people out there like that. So it's a it's a really good question. I mean, if you believe the surveys that are out there now, uh, only about half or so of Americans are, are going to get a vaccine, even when they're offered to it, offered the vaccine for free, which everybody uh, will be. Um, so that's a that is a challenge. You know, as I said, we have going for us in terms of herd immunity. You know, we've had such poor control so far. There are a lot more people who are already immune. Unfortunately, uh, those people are probably disproportionately represented in the ones who you know, are not supportive of the vaccine. They're probably also not supportive of masks and some other things too. But there are important subgroups. Uh, you know, there are different reasons for the skepticism. Um, one big reason that they're just, you know, there's, there's a, contingent of anti-vaccination views out there, which is fairly prevalent in the US, 10, 15% of the population, doesn't matter if it's a COVID vaccine, any vaccine, uh, it's gonna be really hard to convince them to take it. Um, in addition, we've had, we're just coming off a very political year, feels like it's still 2020, at least for another uh, week or so, but very political year where there are strong differences um, by political party in views and confidence in the vaccine. That started to normalize a bit with people who lean Democratic getting more positive views, but a lot of uh, Republicans actually are still uh, skeptical. Uh, a lot of skepticism in rural areas. And uh, another very important group are um, people from racial and ethnic minority backgrounds where 
long history of distrust of healthcare for totally understandable reasons, combined with the extraordinarily rapid pace of approving this vaccine, just leading and the politics, leading to some concerns that, you know, there have to be corners that were cut here, all kinds of rumors out there on social media that are totally unfounded. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do to reach many of those groups uh, to get to national herd immunity, um, to reach many of the groups that I just described, you know, getting at least another 20% or so of the population vaccinated, especially in rural areas and neighborhoods that have been hard hit. Uh, we are totally not there yet. And what's likely to happen over the next couple of months is, you know, we're going to kind of open up um, the availability of vaccines as much as we can, pharmacies, football stadiums, uh, big events, and so forth. Um, and so we'll, we'll drive up our total numbers, but that's mainly going to represent people in that half of the population that really want the vaccine now, it's not going to by itself bring along that other half of the population that's skeptical or hesitant for the reasons that I just described. So the education outreach going forward uh, really needed and really needs to focus on those group, engaging those people where they are, uh, making sure they get the facts about the vaccine. Um, it's one thing for me to believe that, you know, I was FDA commissioner, so I have a lot of trust in this process being done well. Uh, a lot of people are not coming from, from that background, and we really need to do a lot more to reach them. Uh, there will be a, a bigger uh, CDC government-led uh, public education campaign coming soon. I think the Biden administration is going to ramp that up as well. Uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, Joan, that I'm part of this uh, group called the COVID Collaborative, which is kind of a network of uh, uh, across uh, industries and others, encourage people to, uh, to, to Google it, that's partnering with the Ad Council on the biggest public education campaign that Ad Council has ever done, right. uh, over $50 million um, in investment, plus a lot of unpaid time and effort to get messages to uh, lots of different groups, especially those that are skeptical and are having a, having a bit of trouble getting the, uh, getting the facts about the vaccine. This is an area where, um, frankly, a lot of business engagement will be really helpful in um, personalizing, making this information as um, relevant and engaging to these, uh, to these groups as possible. If that doesn't happen, what you're gonna see is um, numbers of people vaccinating going up, looking really good for a while, million, maybe even we'll hit 2 million people per day being vaccinated. Uh, and then come you know, February, March, uh, those numbers will start to tail off, not because vaccines aren't available, but because it's harder to reach uh, these additional groups. They'll see, well, you know, we're getting a bit, you know, there's not as many infections as there used to be. Um, I wasn't keen on doing this before. Why should I get one now? And you can see how this could really get to a state where we have a lot of kind of chronic uh, COVID activity if we don't get more um, uh, uh, effective um, outreach and engagement with a broader part of the U.S. population. Okay, thank you for that. Uh, another question coming in from my friend Sue Espinosa out in Lovett and Touche. She wants to know if she can choose which vaccine to get, the, COVID, the uh, Pfizer or the Moderna at this point, and I assume J&J &J and when others yeah. hit the market. And that's a question that, that a lot of people are asking right now, and, and understandably so. Um, basically, so the answer, the short answer is yes, in terms of what would make you go one way or another. I mean, honestly, I haven't seen much to distinguish the, uh, the Pfizer or the Moderna vac vaccines in terms of effectiveness and side effects. You know, one's three weeks apart, the other one's four weeks apart, but, you know, not much else in the way of difference um, because of the storage condition differences, you know, Pfizer's a bit tougher with that ultra cold storage in some parts of the country, it's probably going to be easier to get um, access to the Moderna vaccine. Okay. That's fine. Um, if you're not super hurried, and, and this is not a J&J &J marketing plug, this is just, um, just you know, reality. Um, if you're not in a super hurry to get vaccinated or you're not in one of those very high risk groups, um, I, I'd at least wait for the J&J &J readout results, which should come within the next couple of weeks and see how that looks. The bar for these vaccines is now very high, you know, 95% uh, effectiveness in terms of suppressing you know, even any kind of symptoms. So that, that's not just, you know, they're very effective in preventing hospitalizations and serious consequences. What we're seeing with some of the other vaccines, like some people um, may be thinking about, you know, an AstraZeneca vaccine that's available in other parts of the right. world now. They had some, you know, sort of serious bumps in the execution of their clinical trials that, that especially in the US with you know, two good vaccines available, the FDA wanted them to you know, kind of correct that, get more complete evidence. So uh, that'll be happening over the next couple of months too. But um, that vaccine has 
with its current dosing and uh, uh, current um, levels of dose and, and two dose patterns, uh, something like 70% effectiveness. And you say, oh, that doesn't sound that good compared to 95. And you know, I guess it doesn't. But if you look closely, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine looks actually very effective in preventing serious cases of COVID. So, you know, when that one becomes available, if it, if the further data tracks with what we know so far, hey, you might have a bit higher risk of um, having uh, minor symptoms, you know, headaches, aches for a few days, cough, um, but probably, you know, very good protection, almost as good or about as good as the other vaccines against serious consequences. And it has the advantage like the J&J &J vaccine of being easy to store and transport. J&J &J is one dose, not two. So that might distinguish it as well. Uh, that's going to make both J&J &J and AstraZeneca very popular in the, the low and middle income countries of the world uh, too, where storage and, and maybe getting people back for a second dose is, uh, is an even bigger problem than it is here. Um, but Absolutely, you'll, you'll, all of these are, are, have been fully financed by the government and under federal law, every health plan is required to pay for them with, uh, pay for their administration with no copay. Uh, so you should have your choice of any of them. Okay, uh, another question coming in from Elizabeth Bath. Dr. McClellan, have you been vaccinated and how was it? Uh, I have not been vaccinated yet. I am not in one of those uh, high risk groups, I guess, lucky for, for me for now. So uh, I can't tell you how, how it was. Uh, what, what we do hear from people who have been vaccinated is it's uh, maybe a bit uh, tougher uh, than you might expect from a flu vaccine in terms of the side effects you get. So maybe a bit more of an ache, uh, um, fairly um, prevalent um, aches and pains for maybe a day, maybe a little bit of fever, headaches, but uh, nothing that lasts much more than a day. Okay. Um, uh, so Sarah Williams coming in now, if you receive a vaccine, will you still have to do a COVID test before you fly uh, to certain areas? And do you think that we're going to have to be able to prove that we've had our COVID test, which we should be carrying along some sort of paper or an app? Is there going to be an app to say you got the yeah. COVID test and all airplanes or other, you know, folks could just put your name in some sort of database? Yeah, I think we're going to get to something like that. We're not there yet. So some of you may have seen the U.S. government just required uh, COVID tests within three days for international travel. And what you're supposed to do is go get the test, bring the proof with you to the airport and the airlines uh, and security, the airlines verify it before they allow you to uh, board the flight. Um, that's a little bit clunky and that you've got to go get the test and, and you know bring this piece of paper with you. So uh, clearly there's some room for making that go uh, more smoothly and easily. So two ways that that's going to happen is first, there are a number of organizations that are trying to develop apps exactly as you said to automatically capture test results and for that matter, proof of vaccination too. One of them is the Commons Project, which is backed by um, Apple and some of the um, uh, Microsoft, some of the tech companies. Uh, so you can Google them. Um, so, you know, they, they intend to have an app uh, coming. There's some partnerships with the airlines and, and, and so forth for that. You can see this maybe also being required or something like it to, you know, to get into a club down the road or a, a concert or a play or something like that uh, too. Um, the other thing that's coming is more rapid and easily available testing. So uh, if you're flying to uh, Hong Kong now, you will go from the airport to uh, a convention center, basically uh, get a, a rapid rapid test and then you still have to isolate for a few days because these tests aren't perfect uh, but it's you know getting built in more to the way that people travel and then by extension I think to the way they do other things so uh, some combination of rapid testing and uh, proof of vaccination or proof of test results uh, I think are going to become much more the norm in the in the months ahead for now though um, we don't even know as I said before we don't even know if, if you're vaccinated if that really prevents you from spreading uh, the virus so even being vaccinated you're gonna have to wear for now a mask on the plane all those usual all those usual measures aren't going away uh, in the next few months okay Got a couple of questions coming in on the same topic. Are there uh, uh, groups of people that should not be vaccinated? For example, people who are pregnant. What are the CDC guidelines on, on people who are pregnant? Should they get it or not? Well, there are very few people, Joan, that, that are contraindicated for vaccination. So we talked before about kids. So if you're under 16, uh, definitely no recommendation, recommendations against uh, getting vaccinated. And if you've had a reaction to a, a vaccine before, 
uh, you're advised to talk to your doctor about it, see if you can understand it. Um, the, the, the most significant side effects we've seen from the vaccines are these serious allergic reactions that are very rare, but they happen. They seem to be happening at a rate of about 11 per million people vaccinated with the, uh, with the two vaccines that are on the, the, the US market uh, for emergency use now. Uh, so uh, if you've had a vaccine reaction before, not, not just a food allergy or an egg allergy or something like that, but a vaccine reaction, um, definitely talk to your doctor about it, your healthcare provider about it before you get the vaccine. And even then it's not necessarily a contraindication for um, those rare cases, you know, it's pretty treatable. Um, so a few people had to get um, uh, epi shots, but um, you know, we'd like to avoid that. And then um, for pregnant women, um, it's, it's really, it's sort of officially it's your decision. Um, personally, if it was my wife of childbearing age, I'd, I'd urge her to go ahead and get it. Um, we, we don't have definitive studies um, in that population. They were um, people who were expected to be pregnant or actually excluded early on. You can understand why we didn't have any idea whether the vaccines worked or not. Uh, there are some supplemental studies getting underway now um, doing uh, um, uh, evaluating the vaccines in pregnant women, uh, but there certainly are lots of um, uh, women at this point with millions of, you know, 10 million plus people being vaccinated in this country alone. Um, lots of women who've become pregnant on uh, after soon after recently receiving a vaccine or maybe didn't know they were pregnant, got vaccinated and haven't seen any significant adverse associations there. But it is a it is kind of a gap in knowledge. So, uh, you know, the official advice is talk to your health care provider and, and, and weigh the evidence. Okay. Uh, last question for you, and it's really about people with immune deficiencies. And uh, my daughter has immune deficiency, uh, this, this person asks, and is receiving weekly IgG sub-Q mm -hmm. uh, treatments for her immune deficiency. Uh, when should she think about getting the COVID uh, vaccine? And do you advise that for people with extreme immune autoimmune deficiencies? Yeah, I'd advise talking to her doctor like right now uh, about it. So uh, there are some vaccines where um, uh, that are contraindicated and people who have um, weakened immune systems. They're typically made of modified viruses um, rather than the way that the new mRNA vaccines are made and some of the vaccines that are coming up are made. So uh, the J&J &J vaccine is a modified uh, uh, cold virus essentially, uh, which is really good for getting your immune system to respond, but does you know, have a few issues uh, and reasons for caution in people who are very immunocompromised. Um, but there are other vaccines that for COVID here and coming that don't have that problem. The Novavax vaccine that'll be on the market later this spring, if things go well, is just a protein, so it can't cause any um, adverse uh, infections and in immunosuppressed people. And the vaccines that are on the market now, the mRNA vaccines, basically that all, what that's doing is injecting um, a, a segment of RNA that matches certain pieces of the virus uh, into your system. It goes into your cells. It doesn't get into the nucleus, not into your DNA or anything like that. And basically tells your cells, hey, make some of these virus proteins. And okay. it's not a whole virus. So it's not anything that can hurt you, uh, but it is enough protein in your system to, to stimulate your immune response. Now there's some people who are so immune suppressed that they can't stimulate a response, but this is actually a good thing for people who have weakened immune systems who might otherwise be more susceptible to COVID related problems. So definitely worth talking to um, a, a doctor about uh, that case. Okay. Okay, well, thank you. That was a very specific one. And we really appreciate your expert advice on, on that. Um, I cannot thank you enough, Dr. McClellan, for joining us today and, and for sharing your precious time. I know you're so busy out there. So we really, really appreciate it. We had thousands of people on the line listening to you today. And I would love to uh, just invite you back later this year, if you'd be so willing to come back and talk to our employees and our clients and our brokers and agents uh, and share your expertise. So this has been terrific. We will have a replay up uh, very shortly on our website. Dr. McClellan, thank you so much. Uh, we're so grateful to you for your public service over these many, many years. You, I know you and your brother, uh, when I was on Capitol Hill, yeah. just a very, very thoughtful um, family. So we appreciate it. Thank your you very much. And folks, we have a number of webinars coming up and I hope you join us for these. They're gonna be on your screen now. So uh, January 27th, we're gonna talk about uh, the future of autonomous vehicles and what to expect with insurance. Uh, geopolitical hotspots uh, for the Biden administration will be on uh, February the 3rd, and we'll have a former Navy Admiral talking with us 
uh, about that. So you can see all of them on our website, travelersinstitute.org and register for those or watch our past replays. So again, a special thank you to Dr. McClellan. I cannot uh, thank you enough and uh, stay safe out there, my friends, wear your mask, social distance, wash your hands. And this is gonna pass soon. It's gonna be over. At least it's gonna be better uh, this year for us. So happy new year, my friends, and please join us on uh, January 27th. Take care. <laughs>